Welcome back to the Superheroes Everyday Podcast. I'm Danny Horn. I'm here with Ryan Steens of the Signal Watch Podcast. Hey, Ryan. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> this is Act 2 of the 2023 Phase 5 Fizzle, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. All right, getting into Act 2, when the actual movie starts. So at the end of Act 1, you referenced at the 49th minute. Mm-hmm. I too paused the movie and said, what damn time How is it? How long is and, it? Yeah. Yeah. Like this is way too long for us to be hitting this point in this scant ass story. They've scattered <laughs> out here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Why am I like a full, like almost hour into this movie and, and just now being told the basics of what I saw in the trailer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have spent the last 49 minutes visiting star Wars locations and punching hors d'oeuvres in the face. <laughs> it, it completely accurate representation of the of the film to date yeah and now we've got janet and her flashback which takes us all the way back to that first scene here we are in the qr back in the day she's hanging out in this dark deserted space she spent 30 years here it is unclear why she picked this particular spot to spend decades in when we know for a fact there are a lot nicer places but here she is in dark world hanging out in her hut without the assistance of food, water, or other life-sustaining resources. Like, we know that there's a place where you can order drinks. I definitely had the thought of, what are they eating? Where, where are they drinking? <laughs> I, I don't usually think about that stuff. There's very little animal life around. Yeah. And there's mushroom areas. She could go to the mushroom area, but we don't know where, like, we don't know where anything is, where this little dark sand place is as, as compared to anything else. According to... The Disney Plus synopsis, along comes the new threat that frightens everyone, Mr. Jonathan Majors. <laughs> she finds out, I wasn't the only one stranded in the quantum realm. Somebody else comes and crashes, who happens to be within like walking distance of her. She meets this dude, does not apparently learn his name. They spend a lot of time together before, he, before she learns his name. He's a traveler. He's a scientist who crashed off course. It's not until like she touches the energy core... And I touched his mind and I find out his name is Kang. What did you call him before? Nothing. So this is actually, so there is a huge problem with this movie. If there's one problem, I actually think it's this, which is the whole story is driven by this relationship between Janet and Kang. That they met back in the day in the quantum realm and she helped him with his ship, figured out who he was and betrayed him and then spent the next several decades running around trying to be a freedom fighter against him. And now she's back, and that's the big event in his life. But they don't put any time into them getting together and bonding. And it's just this scene that tells us that, of like, mm -hmm. what's the thing that made her like him and trust him? He hardly has any lines in this part. It's her narration. There's one moment where she's dragging his ship. She's got, I guess, some animals pulling his ship out of the rocks. And he smiles and that's it. And then he actually kind of like half hides a smile. She explains this whole thing without giving him any opportunity to really speak or show any kind of real connection between them. They're sitting against a rock, one of the many rocks in their immediate environment. She is now referred to him as a friend. And they're looking up at the night sky, which is always night. And it's not the sky. And she talks about hope and how sad she is. I mean, this, you know, it's a super basic line, but like, that's the last thing I did was I, li I lied to her. I told her I was coming back. And he offers her the chance to, to go back. And his way of doing that is saying, time, it's not what you think it is. It's a cage. It does everything it can to break you. It's not until you free yourself from it that you see just how small it always was. Which is fine, but it's not bonding behavior she he doesn't tell her anything about himself they don't establish why she likes him they don't show him being charming at all she doesn't know his name and he feels really cold and it's just it's so weird to me that they spend time on other stuff in the movie and they leave this moment this kind of key moment with no real emotion in it at all there's a lot of things that don't make any sense about this what she she has not told her family about this, but she is utterly not to blame for anything. They say, oh, she's responsible for tons of deaths and she's responsible for she is not. 
Well, we don't actually for that. I would I would say we don't know like what she tried to do as a general or whatever and failed at it. Well, she was never on his side. Yes, true. So she was never the bad guy. Right. That is true. He has her, always her been the story bad guy. is I thought I was helping this dude out. It turned out he was a genocidal maniac. And so I fought him. There's nothing you that you would hide in in, in shame from your children and, and husband. Right. Like that doesn't it just doesn't work as a, as a story thread. And then why she would refuse to say anything about it, like the minute that they're back. I mean, I know that these Marvel movies go through like, which is shocking given how this one turned out, but they go through like 40 drafts or whatever, where, you know, corporate overlords look at it. And and I did wonder if there wasn't a version of this where that's who Janet hooked up with. Yeah. You know, that would have made sense why she would have had guilt or she was with him as his general until she figured out what he was actually on to. Like there's, those are the things I thought was going to happen. And when she's like, oh, I helped fix this guy's car before I found out he was a serial killer. You are not responsible for Ted Bundy if you fixed his muffler. <laughs> I, that's weird that you would have that guilt if you did. It, it, that's just an anecdote. Yeah. Well, here is where Jeff Loveness is going to come into our lives and the lives of our listeners. I am actually going to, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to take some film, I'm going to take some sound clips and put it into the show because I need people to know what a fucking idiot he was. I'll put a sound clip in right now. To me, it was like, well, there is something really interesting. And in like, if a time traveler crashes in the middle of the desert or on an island, you know, you have a ship, but man, you need that rocket fuel or else you got nothing. And I thought about how frustrating it would be to be a man from the future and you crash back in caveman times. How the hell are you going to make rocket fuel? You know, like, how can you get out of there? And it's and that seemed to me so sad and so tragic and frustrating. And the problem is you did not humanize him at all. Like Jonathan Majors does not play that frustration or that experience. He just sits there really calmly and he just says things to Janet that are essentially transactional. You will do this thing for me and I will do a thing for you. They don't let him show any real emotion. He's always buttoned up and he's totally he is one note and in the same mood all the time. And he is supposed to be the point of this movie and all of the reviews even the negative reviews, everybody said, oh, Jonathan Majors is great. Like mm -hmm. the one saving grace for this movie, everything else sucked. But the thing that really works is, is Jonathan Majors as Kang. And I'm like, were you hypnotized? Because I just see him in the same mood the whole time. He talks really slow, for one thing, which yeah. is going to become annoying in a minute. And his entire – he's just transactional. He wants something and he will say or do whatever he needs to do in order to get what he wants from you. He doesn't have any feelings about you outside of that transaction. He has no friends. He has one henchman who he despises and won't even allow him to talk. And he is a character who does not grow or change at all. Like nobody does in the whole movie. Like everybody is exactly the same at the end. But including Kang, who's supposed to be this dude that fascinates us. I'm, I'm not fascinated by him. I can see that people could see that Jonathan Majors is a good actor. But I don't disagree with your assessment of the character is fundamentally kind of one note and boring. He is, he is a fifth generation Ming the Merciless. We don't see him do anything interesting with time, which is kind of Kang's whole thing from what I remember from the comics. He's just Ming the Merciless in this movie, but not as charming as Max von Sydow. He, there's, there's no like dark humor to him. Yes. There's no yeah. even over the topness to him. Nope. But you kind of look at Jonathan Majors and go, I can see he's trying to do a bunch of stuff with what he's got. And I think maybe that's what the reviews were referring to. And as he who remains at the end of, of Loki, he's a lot of fun. He's great. I had a real good time with him in that. I think he's, he's yeah, he's a good actor. And I saw him in Lovecraft Country and really liked him in that too. He's great. But he's not given a character that changes at all as a result of the events of this movie. I haven't watched much Rick and Morty, but <laughs> if you're coming off a TV show that much like the Simpsons, everybody resets every episode, right? That it's that kind of writing of like, we're resetting so that people just basically in the next movie know who Kang is when a Kang, when Kang shows up. Yeah. But, it, but yeah, you're right. It's it, Scott doesn't fundamentally learn any lessons that he didn't already know. Hope doesn't have any lines. <laughs> 
Cassie learns how to punch somebody. Yeah, that's kind of the extent of her growth. She already was a you know socially conscious young woman who was prone to join a rebellion anyway. It's a weird one. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms. Janet fixes the car. And as a result of fixing the car, she puts her hand on the car. And the car is neurokinetic, which means that if you touch the energy core, you touch his mind and you find out all kinds of things about him. Despite the fact that other people later on touch the core, and that doesn't happen. But right now we want a moment. It's actually, it's so terrible. It's This is a moment when we want Janet to find out who this guy is and find out that really he is a tyrant and he has like killed a bunch of people and he's destroyed worlds and stuff. And in lieu of her finding that out in any kind of character way, I'm just going to touch the gas tank in this car. And now I know who you are. And the scenes that they do show are so kind of like confusing and it's very quick information free. We see we see a, a woman and a daughter huddling somewhere and being scared for a hot second. And, and that's and then just him like exploding things with electricity and screaming. But she has made his ship work. And so now he changes into his green and purple villain clothes. And he is pissed. It's actually this might be the only moment when like maybe he was hurt. Maybe he feels hurt because she's rejecting him. But that that doesn't last. In, in better writing would actually explore that and do something with that later on in the film. Suddenly Janet has a wasp suit that she's wearing. Which I'd forgotten was a thing. She doesn't do that anywhere else in the film. Including in places where it would have been helpful. But all of a sudden in the flashback, she's got a wasp suit on and it bings into existence. This movie has a lot of faith in suit in these magic suits that appear and disappear and give you magic pin powers whenever you really need it. So she darts into the ship and she shrinks the energy core and she flies away with it and the ship falls down and he is furious and he starts shooting blue energy bolts. The way that she deals with things is that she pulls out of her pocket some pin particle disks that she happens to have. Some blue, I, I believe these are blue ones. Janet takes these and she smashes them together with the energy core and she throws it and it explodes and it becomes this really huge thing with huge red crystals in it. And that made him unhappy. <laughs> yeah, it makes for a cool visual effect. It does. I'll, I'll give it I'll give it that. So the core is blown up. But now that he has his suit back, which he does, and they have amazing faith in these suits, like now all of a sudden he has one, too, where he can just kind of blink. And he has a helmet on that makes him look all mean and blue. And he has like a cape and stuff. And she says, now that he had his suit back, he became what he always was, a conqueror. He's got weapons and technology centuries beyond anything we've seen. He took his prison and made it his empire. Okay, he's just got a suit. He has a cape. It really, like he doesn't have the car. He doesn't have the time and spaceship. I don't know where he gets weapons and technology that are centuries beyond anything of anything. He has a costume, and that means that he now has an empire. And so we see this weird city that might be full of stormtroopers or might be full of other people. Real hard to tell. With the cantina, we saw this very diverse, apparently capitalist society. But Janet just kind of says he took over. And then he has been, like, beating up the Monsters University people. There isn't really much information that they give about what he did or how or how he rules this place or what his policies are. And I've got a big question, which is, is this all personal or is there like an ideology here? Why is he doing the things that he's doing? I think that is one of the most fascinating things about this movie is that I think I alluded to in the first act. Nobody has any motivations in this movie. He is absolutely motivation free because they're trying to play hide the ball constantly with who who he is and what's going on with him to an absolutely absurd degree. I couldn't believe that was the sequence. Like I, I just was utterly shocked when that sequence wrapped up and I was like, that's your dark secret background. Yeah. That's horrible. That was just absolutely made. And I felt bad for Michelle Pfeiffer. Like, Talk about a class actor and and someone who probably was just like, I'm just having fun at this point in my career. If this is if this is what they want me to do, I get to wear a cool suit and look gorgeous. And I've got a great glam team that's making sure (laughs) I look like Michelle Pfeiffer in every shot. 
it's in my contract. <laughs> you know, I can I, I'll live on a desert planet for 30 years and look like I just stepped out of a salon on Rodeo Drive. Cool. I'm that's what and then when you talk about like what you want to see in a film, that's I that's yeah, 100 percent what I want yep. to see. Yeah, I'm done with that. But it that sequence made me legit feel for her. Like, cause you know they go to these screenings, and this is the first time they see the whole thing cut together. She's not a stupid person. She's got to just be like, well, not everything can be Batman Returns, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just it feels like there isn't enough in the script to really explain just even what the story is here. It's I have to go back to Star Wars again, where it's like they're just they make some gestures towards Star Wars. He's a bad guy. He's Darth Vader. And mm-hmm. then you just kind of like wave your hand. And that means that he has created this totalitarian empire machine. I got good news for you. What was that? Here comes Modok. Hey. Here comes Modok. <laughs> so there is a big question. When so in those Jeff Loveness, the article that I read and in the interview that I saw, mm-hmm. Modok comes up quite a bit. That appears to be that bugged him that people did not like his take on Modok. Modok is a dumb character who I guess people have some kind of affection for. I think people have an affection for Modok from the comics because he's so crazy and dumb. He he fits he's into silly looking. Yeah. Yeah. He fits into like a Grant Morrison's concept of like mad ideas. Like it's like comics exist and do really well because of mad ideas. Like you get bit by a spider. Now you have spider powers and can do all this crazy shit. Jump around on walls. Yeah. And MODOK is kind of like Kirby and company at their like, I don't know. We got to have a new villain this week. (laughs) Right. Let's make a dude who's just a huge, a huge square head. Yeah. Yeah. And and people were like, that's so bonkers. Yes. We want to see him for the next 50 years. More MODOK. But sparingly, but more Modoc. And he's got a silly name. He's got a silly Modoc, name. Modoc, which is mental organism designed only for kissing. Yes. I mean, it's so silly that there was a Patton Oswalt stop action show of Modoc because they knew, like, there's nothing you can do with this guy in the movies. But they did. And he comes up and he's shooting stuff and he has a big gold mask on and he takes it off. And then is the surprise reveal of a character who I had completely forgotten about. Because you hadn't seen him on screen in 10 something years. Yeah. But it's Darren. Yeah. Ta-da. And so they have to do this flashback. They have to use footage because yeah. they know when they did test screenings and they're like, it's Darren. And everyone's like, who the fuck is Darren? We've had 25 Marvel movies between then and now. And he <laughs> right. didn't have any char- much of a character to begin with. Yeah. So it's uh, the it's the kind of villainy guy from the first movie who got beaten up and shrunk down into the quantum realm and left there. And I mean, but there is some, there's some dramatic weight to that. Like the thing that you did, this is if, if we were going to have a feeling about something, we could have a feeling about this is that like you shoved me down into the quantum realm and then forgot about me. Like I didn't matter. And I've been down here for all of this time and I've allowed hang to turn me into a monster. I think there's a really interesting hook there. Yeah. Does this movie do anything with it? I mean, oh. then they take him and they and this character who where there's potentially a little bit of like empathy or something that you might have. But then they turn him into the big silly Modoc, and he's got a huge face, which always looks like a 1980s video effect for some reason, which I, I was just absolutely baffled. It by is 100 percent Uncanny Valley. Yeah. Where you want to either find it scary or funny or something. I read a thing. The VFX people apparently had to rebuild his eyes from scratch. They were trying to figure out how do you take a person and turn him into something that is this shape. And their solution was that they had to like completely rebuild his eyes in CG, which is a terrible idea. You should never rebuild. The eyes are the most important thing. (laughs) If there's one way to make sure that you land smack in the middle of the uncanny valley, it's to to mess up the eye lines. So well done on that. (laughs) They are in prison now. Scott and Cassie have been captured by Kang. And they are behind these fuzzy force field jail cell shields. There's a dark hallway. And there's kind of this ponderous like walking sound as he walks towards them. And this is when the slow talking really kicks in. So he says, you're an interesting man, Scott Lang. And they say, who are you? Just a man who's lost a lot of time. 
like you, but we can help each other with that. Oh my God, you're so, you talk so slow. <laughs> and that's his character is just talking that slow. I don't live in a straight line. And with time, it's hard not to skip to the end. So you want, and this is actually, this is the line. So if you want to stop what's coming, and trust me, you do. I am the only shot that you have. He talks so slow. I don't even have a joke beyond that. Just he talks really, really slow. Well, does Scott ask what's coming? No. That's a really good question. Yeah, nobody ever asks Kang for further details. <laughs> Nobody's interested. And this is why I'm I'm baffled by this movie. Yeah. That's kind of what was the hallmark of what made everyone kind of talk about why are people enjoying Marvel movies when prior superhero movies were not successful or were considered to be garbage. And part of it was they were like, we're aware of the nerd factor and it sucks that we have to spend three hours making a movie, but that's how we fill in all the detail and answer all the questions about like, did Scott ask him what the next thing is? Because the, the, those are the things that are considered to be B-movie tropes, is characters who are stupid for the purpose of the script to do whatever the script is going to do. And this movie was such a throwback to the shitty movies we watched growing up that had someone, you know, do, please give me any crumb of a superhero, you know, sort of thing. And that's the kind of shitty writing those movies had because they're like, it's superheroes. It doesn't effing matter. And, right. and we can do whatever. And this movie felt like that for the first time for a Marvel movie for me. Ryan, if I were to ask you, what's the heart of this movie? The annoying thing that people always ask. What's the heart? Uh, how many holes do you have? <laughs> it's actually, that's more of a heart than what they think it is. But, they, you know, but it's Scott and Cassie. It's a father's love for his daughter. Yes. Which... They act like is a thing that we have never seen or experienced before in fiction because they keep hitting it and they hit it here real hard. So so Kang says, basically, there's a thing I want you to do. Scott actually does not know. He hasn't heard that story from Janet about like why this is a bad guy. But he just automatically knows this guy talks really slow. He must be evil. So, no, I'm not going to do whatever it is that you want me to do. And we just have decided that's important. And so he says, you'll do it or I'll kill your daughter and make you relive that moment. And it's all very slow. And then he picks Cassie up with his mind and kind of like mildly hurts her to get her to scream, which is awful. And, you know, and asking like, do you want her to live or do you want her to die? And so obviously it's a father and a daughter. And so therefore, he's going to say, no, 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 I'll do anything. I'll do anything to protect my daughter. And that's the heart. And that's going to be the heart for that. That has been the heart up until now that all I want to do is protect Cassie. And that's going to be the, the thing all the way through the end of all I want to do is protect Cassie. And unfortunately, that is a character motivation and trait where it's not you're not allowed to waver. Like you're not there isn't going to be a moment in the movie where it's like, well, maybe I'll just kind of let her suffer to, you know, to have this happen. Like, no. So there's no growth in this, in the heart of this movie. It's just kind of there. Nor does it ever feel particularly, I hate to use the word authentic, but mm -hmm. it just, like everything else in the movie, just kind of shorthands and goes, you know, how fathers and daughters love each other. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know. Right. And that gets us to the next thing. So they go to the place where Janet created this big frozen red crystal explosion with things in it that is the the energy core that he needs you know anytime anybody says the word energy in one of these movies it's always a problem you know you know that there's something it's bad. only worse when they also say energy signature <laughs> janet blew it up and so to fix this he wants scott to shrink down and once he's inside this energy core he wants him to find the energy core. There's a small energy core within this large energy core, and he needs the small energy core so that it, it will collapse the large energy core into the energy core. Is that what was happening? That is what's happening. <laughs> it's just and like, then right. Cassie And Cassie hugs him, and she's like, this is my fault. I messed up. And his line here, Cassie, my whole life happened because I messed up. 
what do you mean my whole life happened because I messed up? What does that even mean as a line? Scott jumps in. A lot of this movie is just falling through levels of things that aren't much of anything. So this particular flavor of concentric nonsense appears to be like shards of glass and then tentacles and then swirls of fire and then blackness. And it's like this movie is all about the surprising things that you find when you shrink down and down and down to the smallest thing that there is. And then it turns out that there's more down that you can shrink. And my question is, how much down can there possibly be before you get to a place where you don't have any more down? I definitely thought about that watching this movie. There appears to be what this suggests is that there is a quantum realm of the quantum realm. Yes. Where you get so small that even the quantum realm people are like, hey, what's down there? How you doing? Yeah. And it's just more of it. Infinite levels of, of down, apparently. And it just it feels just like this is like what we can make as opposed to what makes sense. So here I'm going to put in another clip from the Jeff Loveness interview. This is the writer of this film for what he was thinking about for this part. There was a psychological sequence in that probability storm or that quantum nexus. There was more of yeah. a dream sequence element to it. I had like a big, like man-sized ant that was going to be almost like a ninja turtle, the way they looked in that 90s movie. Like a like not CGI, like make yeah, it almost yeah. like, a, like a Cronenberg the fly kind of like ant. And it was like in his head. I wanted it to be voiced by Werner Herzog and give nice. him some sort of like holy mountain kind of advice or like just some vision quest thing. Uh, that didn't get in there. And the problem is that these are not ideas for a movie scene. They're just things that he thinks would be cool rather than things that would advance the story or do something for the character. So he's just like, yeah, I'd like to do like a big prosthetic head from the fly. And then Werner Herzog talks and he's really struggling here. What he's suggesting is that when Scott goes down into this extra bit of down, that he's going to learn something, that there's some advice, that there's a vision quest, that there's something that he learns about himself or about the world. So sort of on this page of the script, there's a big circle and it says, put in thing that Scott learns here. This is the scene where like, it's going to look like a dream sequence or something and Scott's going to learn a thing, but they don't actually have an idea of what he's going to learn and how that's going to drive the character forward. It's interesting you should say that because he talks when he's talking about like his like Lord of the Rings hero cycle yeah. thing. Yeah. He talks about the outline that when he worked on Rick and Morty, Dan Harmon would make them fill out basically a form of all of this, the Joseph what Campbell steps. Yeah. And that's basically how he wrote this. So I'm sure he was like, okay, learn something here. And he's like, I can't, can't quite figure it out. Hand wave, hand wave. Yeah. And, and moved along. I, I will say this sequence was my favorite part of the film because it was visually interesting when you have the pile of Scots. Yeah. And it, it surprised me in how they decided to solve the problem. And it, because it was also ant related. There's a, like ants will pile up and, and and do all that. And I was like, and that said, I met like below a zero on my enjoyment of this movie for yeah. most of it. So I peaked it to like on the one to 10 scale, I might've hit like a 0.5 here. Yeah. Maybe a 0.7 and been like, Oh, that's funny. Cause this, this is my worst moment. I, I totally accept that. Cause I can see that <laughs> reading too. <laughs> so yeah. So let's get into this. Um, because I'm, I am, I am really sympathetic to like, yes, it is an interesting image. Like them piling up the the Scots absolutely is an interesting like visual image, and and I could see that. The problem that I have is just like what the sense of it, and what they're trying to do with the character. So, like he's gone down, he's gone all the way down. He's in this dark space, and he reports, "I'm in," which is like great dialogue. Thank you. He's in this dark space and inside the energy core. Now there's another energy core that's floating above his head for some reason. He actually landed a bit more down than he should have because now he's like, well, wait, I can't reach that thing up there. Why did you go this far down? <laughs> get a little bigger. Hold that in your hand. That's where it should be. But anyway, it's above his head. He can't get to it. He says, I'm heading in, which I don't understand what that is. And then there's this multiplicity thing where like suddenly another he, he splits off and now there's a second Scott. And they're having a little conversation about what the hell. And then they split and they split and they split. And so then there's like this multiplicity mm -hmm. of Scott's and Modoc 
explains you're in a probability storm that this is every choice you could make existing all at once. And in like 30 seconds, there's hundreds of them, including one from Baskin Robbins. But what choices could he possibly make here doing this? Why do they exist? Well, I, I think the, I like the concept. I like the idea that Scott split into two. Those two started to question things mm -hmm. and that became four, which becomes 16, which becomes whatever. But why? What are the, what is the choice that he's I making? I think that you're right. Though there, there's no there's no choice in the moment. So they but they don't define whether because there's a Baskin Robbins one. Right. It suggests that it's choices he made elsewhere, getting pulled into this basically the multiverse of Scotts. Right. Which would also suggest all Scotts become Ant Man, which is right. ludicrous. But they could have done something more interesting than in the pile of Scotts, right? Yeah. And of have any reason for this to exist. Yeah. And so it is a cool visual thing that then you take all these Scots and and he climbs, he climbs up through that. And then there's this moment that inspires him. And this is the thing that sucks for me. And I'm going to put in another, here's another interview clip. Here's okay. screenwriter Jeff Loveness talking about his amazing idea. But the hardest part of that was like, okay, what is the scene actually about? And how can Scott Lane alone do this? And that's where like the Cassie through line came in. And it's probably good that she wasn't in that storm. It's like, no, no, put her up there. And it's like, oh yeah, if Kang was down here, if the hundreds of people that Kang sent down here, they all fail because there's a million versions of them and they're all fighting and they all just eat themselves. Scott Lane though, it doesn't matter the multiplicity. It doesn't matter how many possibilities or choices he can make. That's when it kind of clicked for for me, it's like, oh, they all want the same thing. They all want to get out of there. They all want to see Cassie. Like, that's what can kind of coalesce them by hidden socialist uh, solidarity messaging of like, oh, we all kind of secretly want the same thing. And when we all kind of fight each other, nobody wins. But if we all kind of realize we all at that fundamental core level do want the same thing and we should work towards the same thing, you kind of see how powerful you are. Yeah. All the Scots in this scene want the same thing because he is one person in the middle of doing something. Like there's no room in this sequence for one of them to be a completely different Scott because it's all supposed to be branching possibilities of what he could do now. And there are literally no choices to make except for very minute details about him, how he handles this. The one thing is like the people who say, well, let me grow big and then they get killed for no reason. That's kind of where there's potential choices, but they don't explain why they die and turn into ropes. And then this as a lesson of Cassie being the thing that they work together for, again, it's just like the most basic, obvious choice. It's the thing that he goes back to again and again and again of like, I'm a father and I love my daughter. And there's no conflict around that. And that like, if the lesson that he's learning is, I love my daughter and want to get back to her. That is not on your hero's journey, dude. He already knew that. He started the film like that. And also, like, I'm sorry, the hidden socialist solidarity messaging is like the most shallow political philosophy I've ever heard, where we all secretly want the same thing. We don't want secretly want the same thing. I don't know how he comes to that conclusion. It, it, uh, so that is why I hate this scene. Yeah, I mean, it it falls apart in, in a lot of ways, uh, but I, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head. It. it I'm horrified to hear him try and claim that this has anything to do with like social socialism, <laughs> socialist theory. <laughs> Such an idiot. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of when I was watching that interview and I was just kind of getting frustrated because he would then name drop things. I'm like, are you just naming things that you've heard other people mention around the Rick and Morty writing room? <laughs> or do you actually have you, like, are you, it's have like, you, have it's you actually like watched Holy Mountain? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is possible that this is all just references for him. Which would be very in line with how a lot of, you know, 20 something humor is. It's like, as long as you reference shit, you're, you're good. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it, it you know, now I hate the scene now that you told me <laughs> Sorry. that. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> we're, we're back below zero on the yeah, enjoyment that's, level. That's what I'm here for. Apparently <laughs> is to convince people. It's like with Eternals being like white supremacist ideology. <laughs> like, oh yeah well now i can't enjoy that movie either huh weird <laughs> that's what this that's what this podcast is about is about squashing joy wherever i find it but yeah i mean it, but then but then ryan yes of course then, then hope shows up there's always hope ryan there is always hope 
he's falling and hope shows up and she grabs him and then she shoots some pim particles at the thing and it all implodes and you know what that means this is the real lesson of that scene and of this movie which is that if you believe in yourself <laughs> and you stay true to your friends you can accomplish anything <laughs> like every movie that has ever been made oh god there you go that's I why this I'm, is a good i movie. think i'm broken now <laughs> <laughs> this is what i do well guess what we're heading towards we're barreling towards the end of act two hank's in his ship and there's modok who kind of introduces himself as darren and they're fighting and that's a thing and then scott and hope have shrunk the shrunken energy core which means now they're big again and the core is small and now it's in his hand and scott says where's my daughter we had a deal and kang just kind of like grabs the core using magnets inside his body they try to fly at him all shrunk up and he kind of bats them away and then modok crashes into hank's ship and hank falls and crashes and then janet is running towards him and kang stops her and he says you left me right here to die let's see how they do so now hank's ship is crushed and kang has the energy core and janet is captured and scott and hope are on the ground somewhere and cassie is a prisoner it is the lowest point for our heroes and not even believing in themselves could possibly save them and that means that this is the end of act two of ant-man and the wasp quantumania as usual with superhero movies act three is the endless battle sequence do not miss that here's what's coming up one of these days somebody's going to make a movie where there's a limited number of henchmen they're trying to play hide the ball constantly with who he is and what's going on with him to an absolutely absurd degree janet says it's over and kang says it's never over, which I fear might actually be the case. And they suddenly go, screw you guys, the, the colonies, we're, we're going back to England. And you should watch them all like getting ready, they're mustering. Get into police, their ship, yeah. And you're like, we're going to attack them now. I'm not against socialism, by the way. It's obviously, it's not that. It's, it's that Jonathan Loveness does not understand what socialism is or how it works. And he appears to think that it's ants. All right, Ryan, I've broken you. And, yeah. and that is why we are here at this lowest point, not just for our heroes, but for you as well. I am I am not on a hero's journey, but I'm on some kind of journey with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. I will see you back here for Act 3 of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania on the Superheroes Everyday Podcast. Thanks for listening. Who are you? Just a man who's lost a lot of time, like you. But we can help each other with that.